Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, for this session. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ramki Ramakrishna, and this is Joshua Cohen. Uh, we are at uh, Twitter with Platform Engineering. And today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, how you, you might apply some neat machine learning uh, algorithm, uh, what's called Bayesian optimization, to the problem of uh, tuning performance in an automated manner in the data center. <clears throat> right, so um, let's see. It's a, the, the slide's a bit uh, light over here, but um, this represents the service graph of Twitter. Twitter runs on microservices, and along the um, edge of this circle is the set of microservices that together make up the Twitter experience. Um, the edges over there are the edges of the service graph, so that, for example, um, in, in the, with the, with the uh, magnified portion of, over there showing the TFE router, edges going from the TFE router to the other <coughs> microservices represent the calls that the, uh, that, that microservice might make to its downstream, um, uh, downstream services. Um, and in turn, those might make further calls to other microservices and, <clears throat> and thus together uh, satisfy the request that came in at the, um, at the front end. Uh, it turns out that, um, as you can tell from the, uh, you know, from the number of services that are listed over here, there's a very large number of services that together make up Twitter. Um, it, and it's about a thousand, you know, several thousand service, services, microservice, uh, microservices that together make up Twitter. And for each of these uh, microservices, they might be um, several instances, horizontally scaled instances, that uh, together make up each service. And of course, these services might come in different sizes, depending on how much load they have to, <clears throat> uh, how many requests they need to uh, service. And uh, based upon that, uh, there's, if you look at all of the service instances running in the data center at any time, there might be upwards of several hundred thousand um, such service instances running. Um, think of a service instance as a, <clears throat> as a, as a Unix process, for example. Um, now, uh, many of our uh, uh, services are actually built out of uh, uh, they run atop the Java virtual machine. So one way of thinking of the service instance is as a JVM. Um, there are, of course, non-JVM service instances as well, running as well, but the JVM makes up a large percentage of, uh, the, of the services that we run. Um, these services run on heterogeneous hardware. Um, there could be several generations of ser servers in our data center, and they're all taking, uh, they're all, our service instances might be scheduled on, one, e on different kinds of hardware. So at any time, a service instance has no idea which, um, <clears throat> uh, which piece of hardware it might be scheduled on. Um, and in addition to that, depending on what the service does, it might have uh, different resource requirements. It might require either a large, uh, uh, large amount of memory or a small memory, depending on how much um, uh, load it serves. Uh, it might make use of several cores or um, only uh, you know, a, a few cores, depending on uh, how much parallelism, how much concurrency it supports. And so uh, the data center actually is composed of many, many um, uh, different uh, service instances running different uh, flavors of, of, uh, of uh, applications. Um, here's a uh, typical performance stack um, of any particular instance. So if, you, if I look at uh, uh, the stack over here, at the bottom is the hardware uh, of the host, and the kernel and OS are uh, running on top of the hardware. And um, in this particular case, uh, we have two Mesos containers uh, running on that host. And each of these containers, uh, in turn, is running a JVM process, and the microservice is executing on top of the JVM. So th it's a <clears throat> layered system, and each layer of this, um, of this service stack uh, might expose a set of parameters, which you might tune for optimal performance of the microservice. Um, here I uh, list, for example, H1, H2 as being the uh, hardware parameters that might be tunable. 
Uh, of course, that tuning may not be done dynamically. Maybe it's something that you set when you release the machine into the data center. <clears throat> the kernel might be tu might have several might expose certain tunables. Uh, there, the Mesos container might have some parameters set, things such as the uh, number of uh, cores that the container ca can use, uh, the amount of memory that the container has, the amount of network bandwidth that it um, that uh, that the container is allowed to use. Um, <clears throat> Um, and then the JVM itself has a whole lot of parameters, and many of us are familiar with, um, you know, tuning uh, various things such as the heap size um, and um, uh, various other heap shaping parameters and so forth in order to uh, maximize the performance of the microservice. And finally, the microservice itself uh, uh, might be tunable um, in terms of how, you know, various uh, um, uh, service level parameters that you set in order to change the. Uh, the size or the user experience. Um, so the, the, the performance of, of the microservice itself is, uh, can be considered a function f of the parameters lower down in the stack, uh, which I list here as h, k, j, m, m and s. <clears throat> and um, turning first to the JVM, which is what we, uh, we are initially targeting, um, the hotspot JVM has, a, has hundreds of parameters. In this case, I'm, I'm listing a few of them over here, and if I look at the count of uh, a version of the JVM that's about probably a year old, um, um, we find that there are about 757 tunable parameters. Now, not all these parameters actually affect performance, but there's a large percentage of them that, that, that do. So um, you could say that there are several hundred parameters that can be tuned, and that might affect the performance of your, of your um, application. Um, these uh, parameters, just even focusing on the JVM, these parameters are of a, you know, there's lots of these parameters, and uh, the performance of your service might be sensitive to some, but not to other uh, parameters. Uh, we don't a priori might, well, we, we a priori may not know the performance sensitivity of your service uh, to the settings of each of these parameters. Um, some of the parameters are, themselves are hardware dependent. So for example, there might be <clears throat> something that uh, uh, tweaks the, uh, the just-in-time, the JIT compiler, and the JIT compiler might emit uh, code that might be uh, uh, better suited to certain, um, uh, CP, uh, certain uh, CPU instructions. Uh, it might uh, be able to make use of CPU instructions for specific uh, hardware better than uh, with older hardware, for example. There might also be mutual interdependency amongst the parameters. So for example, I might say that, oh, I need a heap that is this big. And then once I have fixed that, uh, it might be that the, uh, the young generation has to be uh, tuned after you've figured out what the size of the overall heap might be. So there's lots of interdependencies amongst the parameters. Um, clearly, um, hand tuning something of the scale of Twitter with uh, hundreds of thousands of, well, thousands of services, um, each with uh, different requirements and different performance uh, characteristics is, is a difficult exercise. It's something that's impossible for any small team of engineers to do. Um, if, if what you can, how you can scale down the problem is you say, okay, maybe the, uh, the, the top few parameters that, it, that affect performance are these, and then you kind of focus on those uh, specific set of parameters and uh, try to tune uh, tune those manually, but even if you were to do that, something a manual exercise would be time-consuming. Uh, it would be labor-intensive and uh, very likely error-prone, especially as the number of parameters increases. You have to keep track of what experiments you've run and and try and plot a highly multi-dimensional um, uh, performance surface. Um, as a result, what happens is um, when um, uh, new microservices are written. It is often the case that you look at some microservice that resembles uh, one that has already been written. And so you say, hey, uh, this set of parameters worked well for this service, and my service kind of looks like, like the other one. And so I might be able to set my JVM's parameters like they set, uh, set theirs. And um, as a result of this, there's a lot of cargo culting of, of configurations that, that, that goes on. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Perhaps you have the time to tune this uh, cargo cult culted configuration before you launch your microservice. Perhaps you don't. You find that the performance is reasonable, so I'm going to just make use of it. Um, and um, uh, you don't have time to tune it, for example. 
Um, but even if you spent a lot of time tuning something like this and said that, okay, I'll pick these five parameters, tune my microservice uh, for these parameters, do a whole lot of experiments, maybe I spend two or three weeks uh, 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 performance tuning this uh, service, uh, by the time it's next week and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the service owners start rolling out their, the next version of the service, the performance characteristics have changed. Um, and so what was optimal two weeks ago may no longer be optimal now. Um, in addition to that, because of, all, because of the layering of our stack and because of the fact that uh, in a large data center we don't know which, uh, uh, which hardware instance our service might be scheduled on, and because of the fact that there might be upgrades going on, on at various levels of the stack. So for example, I might be uh, changing my, the version of Linux on, in my data center from uh, one version to the next. Um, I don't know a priori which of these two uh, uh, platforms my service will get scheduled on. So there's a little bit of, there's, there's quite a bit of, you know, there's a lot of churn going on in the data center. There's a lot of heterogeneity. And uh, trying to get optimal performance across the entire spectrum and making that be uh, optimal over time is a difficult problem that no, uh, no amount of manual uh, tuning will, 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 will address. And so uh, it turns out that if we follow the manual approach, then it'll, it, 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 it goes without saying that many microservices will, in fact, be operating below optimality. <clears throat> and so uh, the question is, how can we uh, get a handle on this, on this uh, uh, apparently intractable problem and make it uh, automated? Um, so our approach is to actually uh, um, uh, leverage some of the literature in um, uh, industrial engineering and operations research, which have looked at problems of uh, optimizing engineering devices. So for example, like you have a device that exposes a set of knobs, and by tuning the knobs, you want to find the optimal operation set, operational setting for this device. It's an old problem that has been addressed in various engineering fields. Um, and uh, the way to do it is to say, hey, uh, the function f, um, uh, which, is my, which is the performance metric that I'm trying to optimize, um, is, uh, is a function of uh, x1 through xn, which are the knobs that I'm going to tune, um, to turn. And what my objective is, is to find a configuration a, which is the uh, uh, settings of x1 through xn to the values a1 through an, which is the, no the knob settings, such that my performance um, uh, uh, metric F is maximized. <clears throat> but um, there might be uh, constraints on this optimization problem. So for example, I, e e e uh, supposing I want max to maximize throughput of my, um, uh, of my service, I might still have uh, some constraints on the latency that, that uh, the service responses might, uh, might have to satisfy. So there, there could possibly be a constraint predicate G. Uh, there could be a bunch of constraint predicates, and I can actually represent it uh, as the conjunction of a set of uh, individual predicates that, uh, uh, that must be satisfied for the, uh, for the uh, optimal configuration to be acceptable. So that's how we would uh, model uh, this uh, uh, performance optimization problem. <clears throat> Uh, and then just to kind of um, uh, give you a little bit more of a flavor of the kinds of constraints that we might want to model, uh, I might say that uh, I, I, this, the, the parameters x1 and x2, which are uh, parameters to my performance function, might, should be in the relationship x1 is less than x2. So that kind of constraints, constrains the, uh, the set of uh, uh, configurations that are acceptable. And th that reduces the space within which we must op optimize uh, in, the set, in the context of the JVM, that might mean, for example, that the uh, size of the new generation of the young generation is smaller than the size of the heap. Um, or that, for example, uh, there's something called the max tenuring threshold, which determines how many times GC will, um, uh, will uh, how many GCs uh, an object has to survive before it gets promoted into the old generation. And uh, the JVM itself might set some uh, limits on what the value of that setting might be. Uh, there could be more complex constraints that, that <clears throat> uh, relate uh, some complex function of one or two variables with another function of other variables. Uh, and then the last one, the constraints on the behavior I've already talked about um, a little bit before. Um, so, uh, in, but, but further making thing, the problem more difficult is that um, there are sets of, uh, uh, of um, 
parameters that affect the uh, performance of the function, uh, the performance of my device, uh, uh, in other words, the function f, uh, which we may have no control over. So for example, um, my service doesn't know which other service or which other container it might be co-hosted with on, on, on a specific host. And they might be inter-container crosstalk that I don't have any control, explicit control over. Uh, there might be variation in the, uh, in the load across time, um, which, I, which I may not be able to control. And it is possible that the optimal settings for one load are different from the optimal settings for another load. Um, and then I've already talked about um, not, having, uh, not necessarily having control over the hardware where I'll be, um, I'll, I'll be scheduled. And so oh, when there is uncertainty in these hidden parameters, that appears as noise in your objective function. Um, so uh, the performance tuning exercise itself would consist of designing a suitable performance metric uh, and then decide, deciding on uh, and refining the set of knobs to tune and then using an iterative strategy to tune these knobs. And of course, not all knobs are visible to us. Um, so pictorially, that might look like this. The performance engineer picks a set of knobs and picks uh, settings for those knobs and then, feeds, and then starts up the system uh, that he's trying to optimize. He makes some performance measurements uh, of the metric F that uh, he's interested in, in optimizing. Um, and he makes a couple of these measurements with different settings and tries to figure out the shape of, his, uh, of the performance surface. Um, but and, uh, can, the question is, can we automate this by having a back, black box tuning assistant, something that will uh, that'll, you know, try dif different parameters, look at the shape of the function, and maybe learn what the function shape might be like. And for complex systems, the shape might be extremely complex. It might be uh, a highly uh, multimodal, uh, nonlinear uh, system, as we, as we know most of our, comp our systems are. Um, we make use of a, um, of a technique called Bayesian optimization from the uh, machine learning literature. Um, it's a statistical uh, technique that uh, is, can be used to learn potentially noisy um, uh, objective functions. And we've already talked about how we might have noise in our system, um, iteratively and efficiently. And by efficiently, what I mean here is that through a small number of, uh, of evaluations or experiments of the response surface, we can quickly find our way to an optimum uh, configuration. Um, and, and, and that's what we are saying here, that, the, that in a very few small number of iterations, we should be able to find an optimum setting for our uh, parameters. Um, this uh, technique has existed for a while. It was first talked about in the 80s and, uh, by uh, Marcus in the former Soviet Union. Um, and then uh, there's been uh, more work uh, recently. Um, uh, and we, we are going to be leveraging work that was done at Harvard in Toronto a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, which we have in-house uh, today. <clears throat> and this technique works well with nonlinear, multimodal, and highly dimensional functions. Uh, so it won't get caught in local, local uh, uh, maxima. Uh, let me uh, walk through a quick example to show how Bayesian optimization works in practice. Supposing we have uh, taken three measurements of the system, and those are the three. Uh, so I'm here looking at a single, uh, single variable system, uh, performance shown on the y-axis over there and the, uh, the knob settings shown in the x-axis over here. And we had three evaluations that give us uh, that, uh, that set of points. Um, we might look at this and say that maybe it's, it's worthwhile to look at something uh, that's uh, of setting the value at minus 4, because presumably um, that, that setting might, be a, uh, might result in higher performance. Now, it turns out, and we do not know this, it turns out that the actual function might have this shape which would still uh, produce the same set of settings. Um, so he, I'll walk through an example that, that where uh, Bayesian optimization will try and learn the shape of the surface as we go through. So the way Bayesian optimization learns is that it models the function, the unknown function, as, as a stochastic process. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's what's called a Gaussian process. And this is a distribution. It's a, uh, di it's a probability distribution over functions. Um, in, in, one way to, understand, to, to kind of think about this is that at any point of, uh, of, the, of the space, of the settings of the input uh, parameter, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a distribution of values uh, that, that, uh, uh, that the function might take. 
So for example, if I uh, picked a setting two, um, we, are, we, we have some uncertainty as to where the, uh, the, the value of F2 would be. And so that uncertainty is represented by this, this cloud, uh, which is a distribution, uh, which is a normal distribution <coughs> with, with a given mean. And as we make more measurements, this uh, probability distribution will get modified. So we start with a certain prior distribution, and as we make observations, it gives us a posterior distribution, and we thus iteratively refine and, and go forward. Uh, so uh, there's our um, so the way we, uh, we we figure out what the next point at which we should look uh, to um, uh, to make a measurement is that uh, think of the best point that we've got so far shown over there at the top um, and we we slice the uh, probability distribution and look at the uh, the mass of the of the uh, of the probability distribution that's above it. And so if I take any specific point over here and think of the probability of improvement, it would be the, sum, the, the integral of the probability distribution that lies above the curve. <clears throat> and that's true of each, each point. Now, I could use the probability of improvement as something that would drive uh, the, the choice of the next point. It turns out that uh, people uh, have, uh, have looked at this and found that expected improvement might be a better uh, measure. Um, so for example, I might say that the, the value of the improvement times the probability integrated over the slice that the part that lies above it would, would give us uh, a, a much better measure. So here we've plotted the expected improvement of that, of this, of the Gaussian process, um, given the value that, that, the best value that we have so far. Um, and then uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, it turns out that it's mathematically easy to optimize this function, which is called a surrogate function, the acquisition function. And so um, it turns out that this point would maximize uh, the expected improvement. And so we pick that point and proceed from there. Um, we make a measurement over there and we find that it actually doesn't improve, improve our performance much. Um, I, but we keep doing this at every point uh, refining the probability distribution, the Gaussian process that we have. And over a couple of such uh, iterations, uh, every time picking the best point that we, uh, that the uh, optim optim optimization of the expected improvement um, acquisition function gives us, we eventually find our way to the, uh, to somewhere near the optimum. Um, one thing that I want you to uh, note over here is that there are points at which we actually pick up and do and evaluate the function at points where it actually performs much worse than, than the best point that we had so far. <clears throat> um, there are several alternate approaches. I won't go into the details of this because um, I'll probably run out of time. But a Bayesian optimization has uh, been used at uh, Twitter for a number of optimization uh, problems. Uh, I list a few of them over here, and we are applying it now to JVM performance tuning in the data center. Um, note that uh, this kind of technique could be applied at pretty much every any layer of the stack. We are now focusing uh, mainly on the JVM, and so that's all that I'm going to uh, focus on now. But there's no reason why the same technique would not extend and be applicable to uh, uh, almost anything on the, uh, in the performance stack including, for example, uh, the, the Mesos, uh, the container level, uh, which somehow got skipped in this slide. Um, so uh, I'll actually very quickly go through a, a, a proof of concept that we did, uh, where we picked a bunch of uh, JVM parameters, uh, some of which I've listed over here, uh, for a total of about 30, 30 parameters. So taking these 30 parameters, we ran Bayesian optimization over it. and. Um, the setup was of a large production service to which we applied this, um, but we didn't apply it in production, we applied it in a, uh, in a uh, staging environment. Um, and the performance metric that we were optimizing for is listed over here. It's the number of uh, requests per second divided by the GC cost. And so uh, intuitively, we want to increase the uh, throughput of the system and we want to reduce the garbage collection cost. And intuitively, what that means is uh, the um, latency of your uh, requests would be minimized uh, uh, while throughput is increased. Um, this shows um, uh, how the, you know, this, the, on the x-axis is the iteration number, and on the y-axis is the relative performance improvement uh, uh, with respect to the uh, 
uh, original settings that the service was running with. Um, and we can see that uh, by about the, probably the 20th or 25th uh, iteration, even though we are, uh, we are trying to tune a system with 30 parameters, each of which might take up to 100 different values for a huge uh, space, like 100 to the power of 30, um, even though we, we were searching over such a huge space, and this could possibly be a highly nonlinear multimodal system, within uh, 20 iterations, we had found our way to so something that doubled the performance of the, of the service. Uh, and by the 70, uh, whatever, 78th uh, iteration, we had uh, a performance that was 2.2 you know, of the original performance. Um, <clears throat> so that's the optimum over there. And uh, I won't go into the details, but basically uh, this shows the metric uh, as, um, uh, you know, over time, uh, the blue line represents the, uh, the, the tuned system, the optimized system, and the yellow line represents the unoptimized system. Um, and looking at the two uh, parts of the op optimization function, one was the requests per second, that was the incoming ambient traffic, that uh, is the same for both the uh, optimized system and the non-optimized system, and the improvement was entirely because uh, GC cost was reduced dramatically. Um, uh, I won't actually go into the optimized settings. I'll let you look, look over them in the, in the, um, in the slides that we have. Uh, but basically, what one can take away from this is that if we can optimize, uh, if this optim optimization carried over well to production, then we might be able to extract a data center footprint reduction and therefore a cost improvement uh, in the data center. And so that's really what we are trying to get at. <clears throat> um, the key takeaways is that you have to be aware of uh, hardware heterogeneity. Uh, you have to factor out hardware effects when you're doing these experiments. Uh, there might be load spikes and seasonality, and you have to factor those out by running sufficiently long experiments that will average the, out, the, uh, that out. Uh, you have to uh, have baseline configurations so that you can normalize your evaluations. This is something that I kind of mentioned a little bit before. Um, you have to run experiments long enough that long-range effects appear. So if you don't uh, run your experiments sufficiently long, uh, then the long-range effects may not be visible, and you might what you thought was an optimum turns out not to be an optimum after you've run for about a day or more. Um, in order to uh, uh, increase convergence speed, we want to reduce the amount of noise as well as uh, to increase the quality of the optimum, we want to make it... Um, uh, make it robust uh, uh, with respect to uh, to noise. Um, we can actually the, the technique that I'm that we we are using can in fact be parallelized. So you could have several uh, uh, experiments running concurrently uh, to speed up the the convergence. Um, and finally, uh, suboptimal suggestions such as the one that I showed uh, pointed out earlier. Uh, you need to be able to detect those and, and, and stop them early so that uh, you don't affect the overall quality of service, especially if you're running the experiment in production. And the last bullet basically says that staging is not production. If you optimize something in staging, uh, as we found out the hardware, it, it doesn't translate automatically to production. So it makes sense to run these uh, ex evaluation experiments in production. Um, um, so I'll actually let um, um, uh, Joshua now take over the talk and uh, talk about uh, an implementation of this that he's been doing. Thanks, Ramke. Um, so yeah, so uh, based on what we learned from the original prototype that was built, um, we've started building a system that we call AutoTune. It's a Bayesian optimization automated tuning service. Um, if you put that all together, um, spells out boat, so we like to hit these memes at the peak of their popularity. <laughs> <clears throat> um, we can also just call it Autotune as a service. Um, we take what we learned from our prototype and apply it to the general into a general service that anyone can use. The key goal is that no coding is required. It should just be configuration. Um, it should support any type of service, and it should be running continuously or on demand. Um, and yeah, it should just basically, as you would want from any service, be really easy for our engineers and SREs to run. Uh, so this is an example of what an auto-tune configuration file looks like. Essentially, you give it some parameters that you want to optimize for. I'm just showing one here for the sake of space, but it could be any number of parameters. Uh, you give it an objective query 
which is essentially the function that we're trying to optimize. Um, a job key to identify this in our Aurora Mesos cluster, the range of instances you want to experiment on, and how long each uh, experimental evaluation should run for. Um, this is just a brief systems diagram, which isn't super interesting. So, um, so let's talk about how Aurora and Mesos actually help us to build uh, this auto-tune service. Um, I assume everyone's familiar with Mesos. Um, for those who are not super familiar with Aurora, uh, it's a Mesos scheduler, initially developed in Twitter, later open sourced. Apache project it was designed for microservices. Um, so what does Aurora bring to the table that lets us build this system? Um, it's got homogenous jobs, um, instance level scheduling constraints, programmatic access via the API, fault tolerance, automated deploys. These are all things that make it easy to build our Autotune service on top of Aurora and Mesos. Um, before we delve any deeper, just a brief primer on how jobs are configured and executed by Aurora. Um, jobs are a top-level construct in Aurora that composed of n identical tasks. Uh, tasks themselves are composed of processes. Um, individual task execution is managed by Aurora's executor, which is called Thermos. Uh, Aurora itself is responsible uh, for tasks being resilient to any failures, either of the tasks themselves or host failures. And Aurora and Thermos together uh, facilitate service discovery, so other services in the data center uh, can find those and talk to them, which will be important when we want to send them production traffic. Uh, Aurora, Aurora also provides a Thrift, RP, uh, Thrift RPC uh, API that lets us have full control over anything we need to do when scheduling our experimental instances. Um, so this is sort of the overview of the process that we need to take um, when we go to launch Experiments Aurora. Um, by the time we're talking to Aurora, we already have our suggestions from uh, Twitter's BayesOp service. Um, so effectively, we need to find the primary task config from Aurora, inject our suggestions from the BayesOp uh, service, make sure that we're uh, consistently running it on the same hardware platform, and then finally pick an instance to run it on. Um, ideally, Aurora jobs are homogenous, but during canaries and upgrade, uh, updates, they might not be. Um, so we need to pick a task config that uh, identifies sort of the base level task config that we can uh, make all of our experimental changes to. We use a simple heuristic for this, which is just picking the most common task config among all instances, but if we needed to, we could uh, do that differently. Uh, so I'm talking about a little bit about task configs. This is what uh, an abridged Aurora task config looks like. Um, the key things to notice here on top of the obvious, like these are the resources to use, are uh, you know, it allows specifying task level constraints. It's got some uh, data for Aurora's executor, and it allows us to specify metadata. Um, and so this is what Aurora uh, Thermos's executor config looks like. Uh, we have a list of processes, um, and there's constraints among those processes that uh, define the order in which they should run. So this uh, constraint here says that the stage process must run to completion before the run process completes. Um, you might be asking, so if we look back here, we have, uh, you can see in the command line, there's a little bit of auto-tune specific stuff uh, here. Um, so you might be asking yourself, how can we guarantee that that's all in there? For the sake of time, we have uh, a helper uh, built into our Aurora install at Twitter that all JVM processes run through, um, which gives us a convenient point to hook into to add those necessary flags. Um, if you'll recall from that um, command line, um, we're looking for this autotune config file, and effectively what we do in the autotune service is inject a new process that generates this file for us, um, which effectively uh, exports a bash variable that contains all of those command line flags that we want to uh, pass to the experimental instance. Um, but the process by itself is not enough because we need to make sure that that runs before all of our uh, other processes, otherwise, um, we won't know that they've picked up those settings. So we also inject some constraints that guarantees that our process runs first. Um, 
as Ramke mentioned, one of the lessons we learned from our prototype is that uh, hardware differences definitely impacted the optimal settings. Um, so uh, thankfully, Aurora allows for us to make scheduling uh, decisions based on Mesos attributes. So we just configure our Mesos attributes um, with a, uh, our Mesos agent with an attribute specifying the hardware platform, and then Aurora can schedule on that constraint. Um, last thing we need to do before we can launch an experiment is uh, pick an instance to run it on. We want to make sure that we're not uh, clobbering an existing experiment, so we inject a little bit of metadata so we can tell our auto-tune experiments from normal instances of a production service. So we finally have modified Aurora task config. Um, this is where Aurora really helps us out because of its built-in uh, job update support. We just initiate an Aurora job update with this task config. Um, if the suggestions are bad, Aurora automatically rolls that update back. Um, Twitter doesn't go down as a result of this because we are experimenting on production instances of these services. Uh, Autotune then detects the rollback and uh, updates our base op, uh, base op service uh, to let it know that those settings were no good. Um, once the experiment is running, Aurora's built-in support for service discovery means that this uh, instance is taking uh, real production traffic just like any other instance of the service. If the suggestions are bad and the, uh, the service fails, Aurora will restart it, uh, will detect if there's too many restarts and mark it as bad. If we're also monitoring metrics um, while these are running, if the metrics are bad, we uh, mark it as bad again. Um, so finally, experiments will run for whatever the service owner duration uh, was specified as. Um, once the evaluation is complete, we uh, check the objective query, feed those results back to, into the base op service for the next round of experiments, and repeat the thing uh, over and over again until, as Romke demonstrated, we eventually find the global optimum. So eventually, um, Experiments will converge on an optimal setting, and this part is you know, currently manual in that SREs will take those settings and apply them to the service, but hopefully one day it will just be automatic, and we'll just keep doing this over and over again, continuing to uh, feed those settings back into production services. And so uh, looking back at the diagram that uh, we saw earlier, um, we replaced this you know, black box tuning assistant with Autotune. Um, we replaced the performance engineer with the base op service. Uh, we have um, Twitter's existing monitoring infrastructure, and it just keeps running and running. Um, so this is great for the JVM, um, but what can Autotune do for us outside of the JVM? Um, one area that I'm super excited uh, to explore is automatically sizing Aurora instances. So instead of uh, engineers having to figure out that I need four CPUs and 12 gigs of RAM, Autotune will just figure it out for you. So uh, in conclusion, uh, given the scale of the problem and the possible gains, uh, it seems clear to us that some form of automation is desirable in this space. Uh, like we do for uh, QA, continuous performance optimization appears inevitable for efficient operation of uh, microservices. Uh, BayesOpt, because it drastically reduces the cost um, of search for an optimum, appears well suited to the, be, uh, as the technical basis for this kind of work. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so at Twitter, uh, we think that because of the current state, uh, uh, we believe that the current state of the art in containerization combined with commoditiza commoditization of machine learning technologies opens up new frontiers in operations, uh, scalability, and performance engineering. Things that were previously unautomatable are now automatable. Uh, our work on Autotune focuses on a small piece of the stack and uses a tiny subset of what's available in machine learning today. As you move your platform uh, and your infrastructure onto uh, services like Mesos, uh, you know, we encourage everyone to examine what opportunities for automation, autom automation and optimization are available to you. And in the negative 15 seconds I've got left, I'm happy to answer any questions.
not at this time. <laughs> I'm great. So, yeah. yeah, so I mean, the underlying machine learning, um, the Bayesian optimization system is available uh, open source. It's called uh, Spearmint. Um, so if you look on GitLab, uh, GitHub, you can find that. Um, but the, the orchestration piece that is AutoTune itself, um, maybe one day, but yeah, at this. Right. So, I mean, just looking at a lot of the pieces that you guys have built here, I can see a lot of other potential possibilities. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, come to Aurora Slack, talk to us about it. You know, we're, yeah. I don't think there's anything here that's particularly proprietary, so we're not opposed to the idea. So. Cool.